Y seguimos aquí en Ponte en Acción, analizando el momentum del mercado, poniendo el foco en la COP29, en esa cumbre de la acción climática organizada por la ONU. Vamos a descubrir eh, inversiones eh, sostenibles, eh, que ya saben que no es una moda, es algo más que una tendencia, una exigencia invertir en empresas eh, que contribuyan a reducir el impacto medioambiental, la huella de carbono y, por supuesto, en este caso, inversiones sostenibles. Eso lo vamos a hacer en estos eh, próximos minutos con Peter Barner Fair, eh, Head of Active Ownership de Robeco. Peter, good morning and welcome. Good afternoon from Baku. Well, uh, COP29 uh, starts, uh, there are always uh, challenges, uh, global challenges. Uh, how, do we, how do we get here? Uh, at uh, what point uh, do we reach it? Yes, thank you for uh, that question. Um, I think the <clears throat> negotiation this year will be really focusing on um, what they call the new um, collective quantified goals, so NGQG, uh, uh, which is the abbreviation for in a very big global commitment. So over the past um, 15 years or so, uh, the, the countries globally have committed to spend 100 billion uh, in uh, in money to uh, to address climate change that has been very difficult to countries to meet that but actually the amount is way too small to uh, address all of the issues particularly in developing countries so they're talking about maybe even a 10 times as big uh, target that needs to be negotiated so that will really be the the center of the discussions uh, from our perspective for for Robico as an asset manager we really try to work with both the governments and the the companies that we invest in uh, to see how they can set more ambitious uh, nationally determined contributions the NDC targets which will need to be um, set up next year again um, and those are the targets for decarbonization by 2035 so that's very important for us as an investor to know what these companies and countries will commit to do you think uh, the goals uh, are ambitious Uh, I think the, 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 the world needs um, uh, ambitious goals. Um, the challenge, obviously, is that every country goes in with its own space to negotiate. Um, and I think that is where, uh, yeah, always uh, COP becomes a very challenging process to see towards the end how the negotiations play out in the, the final text. All countries need to agree on the final text. It needs to be a consensus. Um, so if only one country does not agree, uh, it becomes very uh, difficult negotiations. But I think the, um, the ambition level is there. Um, obviously, the, the geopolitical backdrop this year makes it extra challenging to reach that level of ambition. Yeah, geopolitical tensions, uh, amid the uh, geopolitical tensions, uh, the return of uh, Donald Trump, uh, are you concerned uh, it will impact uh, these goals and uh, be reflected in the market. Uh, should we expect uh, uh, United States uh, less sustainable? Yeah, so the, the um, signals that uh, uh, um, President-elect Donald Trump has, uh, has, has given already in, uh, in the first weeks after the elections is that he indeed is planning to move away from the, the Paris Accord, as he also did in his first term. Um, this makes it very challenging for the other countries to come to a, a global agreement if, if the, the second largest economy from a carbon footprint perspective in the world is no longer at the table. Um, so I think this uh, this is indeed a, a very difficult backdrop for the negotiations. At the same time, I do expect um, to see signals from all of the countries united here that they do continue um, steadfast. And I already have seen, uh, for instance, news in the Netherlands from um, the oil company Royal Dutch Shell that they have called upon uh, President-elect Trump to continue to be party of the of the COP uh, negotiations, given how important it also is for them to have a level playing field for all oil and gas companies globally to move in the same direction when it comes to uh, to plans for the for the energy transition. Uh, there is a, a long way to <laughs> to go, uh, Peter. Um, sustainable investment. Uh, have gone from being uh, an option uh, to almost um, a requirement. Uh, what is mm -hmm. uh, this impact uh, beyond uh, financial benefits? Yes, I, I think you, you see quite a, a strong development from various regulators that they really uh, put sustainability at the heart of what they require um, in terms of fund disclosure, in terms of how funds are managed, in terms of how you make your investments, 
how you declare your preferences as, a, as an indiv individual investor to your asset managers. So on all accounts, we see indeed these requirements come up. From our perspective, this is indeed a very important development to really mature the market when it comes to uh, working with sustainability, uh, which is a very important part of uh, Rubico's strategy as well in terms of how do we develop and manage our, our funds. Um, and, and from that perspective, indeed, um, this is no longer an, an optionality. It is really um, yeah, core to, uh, to how investments are, are managed. Sustainable investment or ESG uh, criteria, ESG requirement, uh have gone uh, from being uh, an option to almost a uh, requirement. Uh, mm, uh, a recent uh, uh, study of uh, Morgan Stanley uh, uh, recently uh, remarks uh, that uh, uh, there is a, a new public uh, uh, more uh, interested uh, in uh, ESG criteria uh, like uh, such as uh, millennials, uh, millennials or uh, women uh, who especially uh, interest uh, uh, show interest in value ESG uh, are ESG a uh, new driver of the of the market Yes, from our perspective, we see definitely um, that there is new groups of investors that are entering into the market with, with stronger preferences for sustainability. Um, so last year, we have also launched our uh, Fashion Engagement Equities Fund, which I'm very excited about because it applies 100% engagement. So my team is responsible for all of the dialogues with the companies in that fund. Um, so it invests in, in, invest in the fashion industry, but then we um, engage with every company to make their uh, practices more sustainable because the fast fashion industry obviously has big challenges. And this is particularly a fund that will also speak to millennials and to women as two specific target groups that you mentioned from that study from Morgan Stanley. So from our perspective, this is indeed an, a very interesting growth area into the future. It is, uh, Peter, uh, where do you see uh, the biggest uh, uh opportunities based on these uh, ESG factors. Yeah, yeah. When I think about about COP29, where I will be in the coming week for uh, for Baku, I think the options are really in what we call transition investing. Um, so um, a large part of the global economy is still what we would call or consider brown companies in the sense of the steel industry, um, energy companies in in developing markets, and a lot of these have to transition from brown to green, and those are all challenging. Sometimes there's, there still needs to be technology development. Sometimes there's significant capex investments to move your plants indeed into uh, more usage of renewable energy, for instance, to, to ultimately also uh, produce your products. So all of that is, is a massive um, investment opportunity in the coming decade. Um, and, and with the research that we do on sustainability and then also preparing the right um, investment strategies, we think that we can develop products that are that tailored to that. So it's not investing in companies that already have the solutions. They are very important, and we, we do this already for 20 years. But now I think the shift is really to what we call transition investing. So it's really moving those companies that currently are not yet sustainable to sustainable in 10 or 15 or 20 years to ultimately achieve the, the goals of the, of the Paris Accord. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, is a sustainable investment uh, uh, a long-term strategy? Yes, for Rubico, it has been part and parcel of how we think about doing investments since the, the late 1990s, and it's really core in, in our investment strategies. Um, we, we invest heavily in, uh, in engagement. We do a lot of research. We have people in our thought leadership team that develop long-term climate and, and nature strategies and targets. So all of that fits with our outlook that ultimately... Uh, within investment, sustainability sits at the core of all of the risks, uh, both financial and non-financial, that you need to consider to make the proper investments for your, uh, for, for your clients. Uh, what do uh, investors demand uh, most among uh, these uh, requirements? Um, I think climate is definitely uh, top of mind for most investors, given how uh, big the impact is. We've seen the, the tragedy um, uh, lately in Spain. We've seen the hurricanes in the U.S. We've seen so many places where climate change is really coming to the forefront with sort of the physical risk that is now playing out. So investors really understand this and then want their asset managers to integrate this 
in their investment strategies. At the same time, biodiversity is coming up as a topic where a lot of investors ask questions, and we've developed very detailed methodologies to measure that on a company level. And then I think in the future, social issues is on the on the radar, and we're spending a lot of time now doing research to find the best ways of how can we integrate uh, social factors um, such as labor rights, human rights, etc., into our day-to-day -day investment strategies. Mm -hmm. And uh, how important is uh, fixed in income uh, in Robico in your funds? Uh, fixed, uh, for example, uh, income uh, throughout green bonds, or, or for, yeah. what is the performance of your uh, portfolios, uh, Robico? Yeah, so we, we spend a lot of time looking at integrating green bond uh, investments across all of our fixed income strategies. Um, so we think that it is indeed a very attractive part of the market that makes sense. It's also a part of the market where I spend quite a bit of time talking to governments in what we call sovereign engagement. So there, uh, there is uh, quite a few governments that around their sustainable projects have a specific use of proceeds for, uh, for green bonds. And it's a very important entry point. Also, what we, I will be discussing here uh, with, for instance, the Australian government this week again, um, as we have a program already for three years with, uh, with other investors in, in Australia to talk about the long-term climate policy. Um, the Australian government didn't um, issue a green bond in the past. They have done so after constructive feedback from a large group of investors representing more than 11 trillion uh, US dollar. Um, and now, based on that, they are moving into also um, issuing green bonds. So from that perspective, we think it is a very important instrument um, and it, it, it sits neatly across all of our, uh, our fixed income investments. Peter van der Bert, uh, Head of Active uh, Ownership uh, of uh, Robico. Great pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for everything. Happy day. Thank you so much. Pues uh, hasta aquí hemos eh, 